The first thing that we have is issues with glucose utilization, with the oxidation of glucose, the conversion from glucose all the way through glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and then through the electron transport chain to effectively produce energy. And instead, as we'll get to, that gets blocked. There's a buildup of intermediates. The glucose instead gets converted to lactate, and the cell is forced to rely on fatty acid oxidation. While, because of these blockages, there's also a, a depletion in ATP. There's a lack of ATP production. So we have this here in this graphic where essentially what we can see in more detail than we need, we aren't going to go through each of the individual steps here, but the important point that we want to get to is on the left, we have this conversion from glucose to pyruvate. That's glycolysis. That pyruvate then gets converted to acetyl-CoA and enters the Krebs cycle. That's going on in the right there inside the mitochondria. And then different uh, products of the Krebs cycle will then go over to the electron transport chain, which you can see at the top right there, which is where the ATP gets largely produced. There's a little bit that gets produced elsewhere, but that's the main site of ATP production. And so what typically is happening is that there are a number of different things, and we talk through these all the time on the podcast. There's a number of different things that can lead to issues during any of these steps within glycolysis, within the Krebs cycle, within the electron transport chain. Most of them will actually go on at the electron transport chain and block essentially electron transport and drop off at the electron transport chain. And that will then cause issues all the way backward. So that will often start things off. And then we will have issues within the Krebs cycle. And then we will have issues and blockages within glycolysis. And essentially, this is just due to, as you were saying, I think a really good analogy of the car and the engine. What we're this is a an engine problem. This is the engine of the cell where we're producing energy. The problem is not the gasoline that we're putting in, the glucose or the carbohydrates, but the problem is that we're not effectively converting that glucose in all the way through into energy. So we have all this gasoline that's not being used properly. We have a car that's not going, and yet we're blaming blaming the gasoline instead of the engine. And so this is that engine. And what is going to happen, we'll get to in a second, what happens when this is blocked. But the first thing I wanted to note is that as these intermediates all uh, build up, you end up with a build, like a slowdown of the gasoline entering the engine, essentially. And so the gas tank gets full, right? That's inside, like the cell is full of glucose and can't accept more glucose. So that is an aspect, kind of the first aspect of what's going on here, a blockage with the usage of glucose and then a buildup of all those intermediates and a buildup of glucose itself. Yeah. And I think the other thing that you start to see too, is then the glucose starts to actually, you have this blockage and it backs up into the bloodstream. So you have, if you look over at the right-hand side where it says Krebs cycle, and then you have that little magnified glass with the electron transport chain, you get problems in the electron transport chain that leads to issues in the Krebs cycle that leads to issues in glycolysis. And then that leads to a backup of glucose in the cell. And then the cell saying to insulin, Hey man, I can't take any more gas. You already overfilled the tank chill out, like just, just back off a little bit. And then uh, essentially the, the, the other thing is the reason why it, one of the major reasons why the cell can't take up that carbohydrate or that glucose is because it's, it's running fatty acids instead. So you're, you have this other fuel that's going in, that's blocking the use of the carbohydrate and then the carbohydrates getting backed all the way up. And then the body's saying, or the cell is saying to the insulin, insulin, go away. <laughs> like we're good. We don't need any more glucose right now. We can't even take any more glucose right now. And then you see a lot of, you know, the, a lot of the pathways within glycolysis and whatnot all get backed up. And then you get a whole bunch of dysfunction across those pathways. And what winds up happening, and I think you have the graphic right below, Jay, is that the, instead of going, instead of that glucose turning to pyruvate and then going to acetyl-CoA, it just gets shunted towards lactate. And so you just get this, this basically the the body's like, well, whatever glucose we have, we have to, we have to kind of get rid of it. We need to make sure we have enough of these, some of these important products like NAD plus and whatnot. So we're going to just move it to lactate. We're not really going to get all the energy out of glucose that we want. We're going to continue to burn these fatty acids inside the mitochondria. And then we're like, we're, we're just going to keep shunting things to there. And, and you see this in diabetics and you see this in people with impaired glucose tolerance and, and obese individuals, their lactate values are higher. And then their fatty acid oxidation, their burning of fats is higher. And then they have all this glucose in the bloodstream and then the increased insulin levels in the bloodstream that are because the cells are not responding. So that's this actually is a mechanism to explain 
why we're seeing the elevations in the glucose and the insulin. And it incorporates this really important compartment that's not discussed in these other models as much as what's going on inside the cell, inside the mitochondria as the central point and not what's going on inside the bloodstream and the association values in the bloodstream. Exactly. And as you said, what's commonly seen because the glucose isn't going all the way through and oxidative phosphorylation isn't going on with the glucose, it gets converted to lactate. This is a backup net mechanism that helps to regenerate NAD+, which is important for kind of trying to salvage the issue. Uh, but the other thing is it allows that lactate to then leave the cell. So you can keep converting some glucose to lactate and produce a little bit of ATP. This is what happens when we use our muscles at a really high pace and in an anaerobic state. You know, if you're sprinting or something, we'll rely on this pathway because it's very fast, even though it's very inefficient and you can only do it for a very short period of time. So even this pathway will get backed up as well. But it's one of the things that you do see happening when you're not fully oxidizing the glucose. And as you said, you'll see higher levels of lactate in these states. You also see elevations of lactate dehydrogenase, which is the enzyme that converts the pyruvate to the lactate. So those things are both seen here. And then the other thing that happens, of course, the cell needs ATP. And so if it's not able to effectively oxidize glucose, and it's, again, converting some of it to lactate as a defensive mechanism or a mechanism to try to get some amount of ATP, the other thing it does is it starts to rely on fatty acid oxidation because these two things are essentially opposed when it comes to uh, cellular respiration. So when there's this issue with glucose oxidation and we're re relying on glycolysis for some amount of energy in terms of producing lactate, it's not going to get us very far. And so then the, the other thing the cell will do is start to use fatty acids as a fuel. This will allow the cells to produce some amount of energy but it comes at a major cost due to increased production of reactive oxygen species. And as a result of that, and some things that happen at the electron transport chain, it does two things. One is it slows down respiration. It slows down the production of energy, but it also further blocks the utilization of glucose and then the uptake of glucose. So we're going to go through that very briefly here and just explain how fatty acid oxidation then goes and actually blocks the usage of glucose further and also blocks the uptake of glucose. And this is a key feature of what's going on in the cell and insulin resistance. Yeah. So essentially what you see here is you have a, a picture of the electron transport chain. And I'm not going to go into all the exact specifics of how this works. If you want to know how this works, I do have a video discussing it on uh, my channel, Mike Vave. It's a uh, Mike Vave on YouTube or Mike Vave Science. And it's essentially what you're seeing with fatty acid oxidation. So you see on the bottom there, it says beta oxidation. And on the left there, you see glucose. Now with the beta oxidation, you get an increased amount of that value that is pointing to called FADH2 in ratio to NADH. Whereas with glucose, you get more NADH in ratio to that FADH2. And those things change what goes on at the electron transport chain here. And with that, what winds up happening is you get a buildup of that NADH when you're burning fats. And that leads to problems when you go into the Krebs cycle, which is a picture right below, specifically at that, the enzyme up top, uh, pruvate dehydrogenase or PDH. And so what happens is if you don't, so NADH and NAD are kind of the same compound. They just, one has electron, more electrons than the other. And what happens when you burn fats, you get too much NADH and you don't have enough NAD. And then that shuts down that enzyme there that you see converting pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. It shuts down pyruvate dehydrogenase. Now, the problem with that is that pyruvate dehydrogenase and pyruvate are what are the main uh, product that's created from glycolysis. So if you have pyruvate dehydrogenase shut down because you're burning a bunch of fatty acids, you can't feed pyruvate, which is created from the splitting of glucose and glycolysis into the Krebs cycle. And if you can't feed glucose into the Krebs cycle, there's only so many places else it can go, including glycolysis. And so what you're left with, which is what fatty acids can produce is, is just the acetyl-CoA. So the fatty acids will produce that acetyl-CoA and the fatty acids will continue to run the Krebs cycle and the glucose will continue to be blocked. And again, it's kind of this weird feed forward loop that continues to happen because as you burn more fatty acids, you block PDH even more so, and then you can't bring that glucose into the Krebs cycle. And it, it, so it's, it, and this is actually something that's really important for anybody interested in all the hormetic stuff is you're looking at, oh, it's really, you know, what's this NAD to NADH ratio and why is that so important? And it's because it's involved in the reactive oxygen species production and all this um, 
all of the uh, defensive pathways in the cell and fatty acid oxidation, which is something that's discussed as a, as a healing strategy inside the hormetic spheres of the alternative views actually worsens the NADH to NAD ratio inside the mitochondria because it leads to this overproduction of FADH and NADH as, I sh as we just talked about in the electron transport chain and drives an inability to oxidize glucose effectively by blocking that enzyme PDH, which converts the pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. So essentially, then this goes with the metabolic flexibility piece. If you want to be metabolically flexible, you don't want to be oxidizing primarily fatty acids because the fatty acids will inhibit the pyruvate, de pyruvate dehydrogenase function, which will inhibit the ability of you for you to oxidize carbohydrate. And this whole process that we're describing is called the Randall cycle or the Randall effect. And so this is, I mean, this is, this is essentially, you know, this is, this is showing that the metabolic flexibility idea in terms of oxidizing primarily fatty acids is incorrect. This is showing that inside states where you're insulin resistant or you're not able to oxidize carbohydrate, a key portion of that is oxidizing fatty acids. And the mechanisms are laid out here of how fatty acids are actually blocking that process very directly. Right. And as you're saying, if you want to fix, not only if you want to be metabolically flexible, but if you want to fix an insulin resistant state, of avoiding the oxidation of carbs and focusing entirely on the oxidation of fat or trying to upregulate fat burning is going to do the opposite. It actually blocks your ability to utilize carbs. This is very well known if you look at any low carb or keto circles where if they then go and take a glucose tolerance test, it will be terrible. You're very insulin resistant in that state. Again, as we had the caveat earlier, this is not the same as a state where insulin resistance is being caused by other means. It's instead a state where you're, where this is being caused by just fatty acid oxidation over uh, glucose oxidation, where you're avoiding carbs, but it is still insulin resistance. And the important point here in terms of this context is that in this state of insulin resistance, whether it's caused by other means or it's caused by avoiding carbs, and we'll talk about what the other means are later, but essentially it's things that block function at the electron transport chain or at the Krebs cycle, essentially things that block up the engine, things that block mitochondrial respiration, that will force the cell to rely on glycolysis to lactate production and fatty acid oxidation, both of which will block the uptake of glucose. Now, you were talking through the Randall cycle effect here, or the Randall cycle or the Randall effect, as well as the NAD to NADH ratio being largely involved. We've discussed this in previous episodes, so I'll link back to those. But just to expand on one other point, so you mentioned how the increase in NADH to NAD plus ratio will block pyruvate dehydrogenase. And there's a couple other things that go on in the Krebs cycle here, which is one is that isocitrate dehydrogenase, which relies on NAD plus also gets blocked. And that will end up leading to a buildup of citrate. And then the other thing is that you'll, as a result of that, also have a buildup of acetyl-CoA. The buildup of acetyl-CoA will block pyruvate dehydrogenase and the buildup of citrate will then block glycolysis. And so we see that here, where you see excess acetyl-CoA and excess, excess citrate as a result of beta oxidation, These, the excess acetyl-CoA being another factor that blocks pyruvate dehydrogenase, and then that citrate in the cytosol will then block uh, phosphofructokinase, which is the limiting uh, rate-limiting step of glycolysis, and it'll also block the uptake of glucose. And as you know, the buildup of intermediates here will also further block the uptake of glucose. There are some other mechanisms that go on, but these are just some of the ones we wanted to highlight where essentially when you're bur when the cell is burning fat, this is how it blocks the uptake of glucose and causes insulin resistance. So it's really important to highlight that. And as we come down here, we can also see other steps. So we mentioned the phosphofructokinase step, but there's also a step farther down, which is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, where a low NAD plus to NADH ratio will be inhibiting that step as well. So that's another area where we're seeing this. And it's just another important one to highlight. So again, the mechanisms here are all just a way of saying is that it, they're a way of saying that when the engine is burning fat, it's going to block the utilization and uptake of glucose. And so that is a huge component that we see in a state of insulin resistance. If you enjoyed that clip, you'll definitely want to download the free energy balance food guide. The energy balance food guide will help you determine exactly what to eat to optimally support your metabolism and help you lose weight, improve your digestion, get amazing sleep, boost your energy, and so much more. The food guide makes it extremely easy to get started with a bioenergetic approach to optimizing your health. So head over to jfeldmanwellness.com guide to download your free energy balance food guide.